on this episode, we reached the proud episode number 83. That's a big boy number right there. And yet after all this time, we still like the game. Doesn't that look just nice and juicy and ah. Oh. So today, let's make a final plan. And then we're gonna finish the game, it's gonna be easy. Mm, hi everybody, welcome. Welcome back again to uh, the advanced small tutorial to LazyDesk Academy. I'm Christian and this is episode 83. We just completed an incredible, incredible stint of prototypes. We figured out the gameplay. Our shmup is ready to be finished. But now we have to go back. We have to backtrace. We have to uh, take all of the experiments that we took and we have to uh, uh, reconstruct them in the actual game because the, all the stuff, all the development I've done so far has been really janky and, and, and dirty and, and bad and you haven't seen anything of it yet, right? So now I will go through all of the things that I've done throughout the testing. I will just pick the parts that were actually good and I will actually make them good, hopefully, and then we're gonna finish the game. It's gonna be easy. It's gonna be easy, he said. Ah, oh, what a dolt. Oh, anyway, so let's 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 uh, let's diagnose the master plan. Where are we in the master plan? We have some design questions that were hard. We can figure them out. Special ability, we know the special ability. We want this, we know the spread shot, we know the pickups, we know the scoring, we know the UI for scoring, roughly. Um, we don't know these things. And actually, I'm going to put the UI for the new UI. We, we know roughly what we want to communicate. We don't know all the detail and all the nitty gritty stuff. We don't know that just yet. Whatever. I get. And then uh, we don't know the boss about the boss phases stuff. This is stuff that we still need to figure out. Uh, there's also some cover effect stuff happening. You know what? I'm going to put all of these things into leftovers um, that we're just going to carry with us like, like some baggage. Uh, uh, we actually did the fr freeze die in this overhaul. Actually, that's something that I did. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk you through uh, my my thought process there. So this is at uh, for sure uh, done. Hover effect, boss spawning minions. Do we need boss phases? These are things that we still need to figure out. Now we're not about making the game just yet. I just continue doing this step way. I could put a step in between here, but just let me just like. Uh, put in a new category, which is um, prototype debriefing, something like this. Right, so what are the things from the prototypes that we need to carry into our actual game? Big things are things like GUI, the graphical user interface, right? We need to have some kind of, we need to have some score display and stuff that, like that. Or we need a state machine. Uh, we need to have a start screen, we need to have a game over screen, all this kind of stuff. That's something that's stuff that's necessary for the actual game. Uh, we need to have uh, new better shots. Uh, we need to have options. Uh, this is kind of like, I'm, I'm going to put this into one thing because these are kind of like related. Options. Man. We need pickups. We need bombs and oh yeah, and then we need also um, when we have pickups. I mean that there's a lot of things that go into pickups. All of these po points just like will expand when once we deal with them. But pickups, you also need like um, indicators when you uh, pick them up. Like there's kind of like um, pop-ups. Yeah, pop-ups. Pick up pop-up pop-ups. We need to have pop-ups. Uh, and yeah, so that's gonna be recreating the prototype that I have, the winning prototype from the prototyping session, recreating that in our actual in our actual game. And then there's some leftovers. I don't know if we're gonna do this this step or if we're gonna figure these out, the things when we actually make the game. But yeah, let us today, let us today tackle mean some menial tasks just to get warm up. I haven't been coding on the actual game for a long time. I have to like familiarize myself with the game myself. Um, let us tackle the GUI. Um, which is which means custom fonts. <clears throat> let us uh, tackle the GUI, and let us tackle the state machine uh, stuff. Let's let's try to do this today, and then we're gonna do the shots and options on the next episode. All right, all right. How is Kaushmat even looking these days? 
Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's a throwback, man. That's a, such a different game. Holy crap. This is such a different game. Oh wow, it's so sluggish. The movement feels so sluggish. And the shots is so puny. That's so good. Oh man. Once you get used to a certain look and style, it's, it's uh, oh man, oof. Yeah, that's a, that's a flashback right there. Okay, so let us, uh, today we're gonna do a GUI and we're gonna do a state machine. I think we already have a kind of a state machine because I see there's a, this screen, right? That's a start screen. We have this already. So maybe we don't need a state machine that much after all. Um, right, so let us um, tackle the question. Let us first remove all the debug stuff to it we already have. There is some debug stuff that I noticed. Let, let's remove that stuff. Um, we don't need all of the debug stuff here. I'm gonna keep the scroll around just in case. Uh, this is better, yeah, okay. You know what, I'm gonna also remove this debug, it's fine. Uh, no debug at all, empty screen because we're gonna deal with the UI here today with a GUI. All right, so let us talk about the score. So one of the things that we want to do in a GUI in a graphical user interface is we want to show, I mean, we're gonna show a lot of things, but one of the things that we wanna show is the, the score, right? The, there's gonna be a score, right? And do we have a score variable already? I, I'm sorry, I would, all of my code will be now just like me reviewing if something that I did in the project is already is here or it, no, I, I think we had to include it. Okay, so let me put, let, 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 let me put like a little section here. Can I do it like here maybe at the end? Yeah, let's do it like here. Gamply. It's a little bit, I know everything is gameplay here. It's, it's a bit weird to call it gameplay, but uh, let's call this score and let's set it to zero for now, right? And then when we draw this to the screen, we're gonna do, we're gonna do something like uh, here at the end, after we've drawn everything, we're gonna draw GUI. This is the draw function, by the way. Uh, we're gonna do a parent, print, score, two, two, seven. Let's do something like this. So coordinates two, two and color seven, right? So that's white. Uh, let's run this. It's not working at all. Oh yeah, because score is, is zero. Maybe it has to come after the camera. After the camera, I think. So it doesn't scroll sideways because the camera is for scrolling sideways. Yeah, there we go. There we go, attaboy. So we have a score here and just like to, uh, to, to do like a bit of a debug, every time we kill an enemy, uh, we're gonna uh, increase the score. So let me see, do we have a, there's a collisions. Uh, here's where we killed an enemy, right? Um, so here's where the enemy is dead, right? So let's do something like score plus equals 100, right? 100 points for killing an enemy. Bam, score goes up. Wonderful, beautiful. So the score goes up, but you know, if you've been working with Pico 8, you know that this is this is not sustainable. Because we are already, we just played a couple of seconds of this game, and we're just shooting down popcorn enemies, and we already that 16,000 score, that's uh, 1,600 score, that's fine. But those numbers are bound to get really big, really large numbers, it's kind of like a thing that you do in shmups or in arcade games. You get numbers with huge amount of zeros. And the biggest number that we can pull off this way is 32,000. Uh, and then we're done. So I'm gonna make it so that it's 30,000 per killing an enemy. There's 30,000, we're gonna kill another enemy. Oh, suddenly it's negative. Oh, it's positive again. Oh, it's negative, positive, negative. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it doesn't work. Uh, it's uh, The variables in Pico 8 are too small to contain such enormous numbers. And there's multiple ways around this. Previously, we would, for example, do something like just add zeros at the, at the bottom at the end, right? The number is not, um, you might think that you have uh, 30,000 score, but in th indeed you have only just 30 and the three zeros are added at the end. That's fine, that's a fine approach. But for this shmup, I want to actually try some new advanced features for Pico 8 that I always want to use. And that is, there is a way of um, converting, how do I phrase it the best? Um, so the variables that we have in Pico 8, they are, they actually have a lot of bits to them, right? Because they can store, uh, 
numbers only up to 32,000, but they can also store, you know, uh, fractional values. It's a fixed point type of variable which can uh, has a certain precision to it. You can uh, store fractions to a certain precision and has a maximum value. And it actually has 32 bits of information. So there's actually 32 bits of, of space that we can use to store a number, but it only goes to 32,000 because a huge amount of those bits is used for the fractional stuff, right? And in this case, we don't actually need the fractional stuff that much. There's not gonna be a fractional uh, uh, score value. So we can reinterpret a pq8 variable to be displayed as a 32-bit integer which goes way higher than uh, than the regular variables in pq8. And the way to do this is, um, I did, did a video on this once, but this is the first time I'm actually using it in a, in a project. So um, toaster to string and then the variable that you're talking about and then comma and then there's a magic number 0x2. Ta da So if you do that, then the variable that is, the number that is stored in the variable is converted or like uh, written out as a 32-bit integer value. And if you run this, it's still zero, but if you shoot down an enemy, I actually don't know what happens when you shoot down an enemy. Come on, where's an enemy? What happened? Why don't we have enemies? Did we, did we do something wrong? Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. That's a big boy number right there. Oops. Oh, okay. Now, now we're also uh, switching between positive and negative. And, uh, but that's because we're kind of working with different units now. Like adding one, like, and, and we'll show you. I'm going to add one to that to the score now when I shoot down an enemy. Okay, one, just one. Oh. 65,536 is now one. One is, is that amount of, of, of points, right? So we need to kind of like uh, uh, add less than one if you want to increase the score by one, right? And the amount you add is that you add a fractional value. So it's this one. I have to just copy it in here. So it's zero or zero x, uh, it's hexadecimal. So 0 0.001 in hexadecimal multiplied by the amount of points that you want to get, right? So this one, in this case, is going to be just one. And uh, so that's like a very tiny little fraction that we're adding to that number. But that little fraction, when written out as a 32-bit integer, is going to be a normal, like a normal number. Uh, let, let's, let's watch this in play. So there we go. There's one, two three, four, and so forth. So now we can save way bigger numbers, right? So now we can do 32,000. That's totally viable now. Right. And we get millions easily. No problemo, right? No problem at all. Cool. Uh, what is the maximum score that we can get? Wh where is the where is the stop coming in? Uh, I, I mean, it's around thirty-two thousand, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's around the the number that we're gonna have get into troubles. But I mean, it's like what twenty trillion? It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine, boys and girls. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is just, I want to show you this trick of how we're gonna get score into our game. Um, so here's how we write the score to the screen, and here's how we add value to that score. We have always have to multiply it with this kind of like fractional value, and that's gonna be it. All right, so now we have the score here, but there is one problem that I have here. This score doesn't look epic, <laughs> to use a bit of an old term. It doesn't look epic at all. It's, it's, it's this flimsy little number, and you can you can tweak this a little bit. For example, you can use uh, you can add a drop shadow to it. You can uh, draw a second number underneath and make it dark. You know, something like this. Is it two or one? It's one. All right. So we're drawing the score twice. We're drawing it further down to set it to the dark color and draw it f a little bit further up again and make it white. So it looks like if there's a drop drop shadow, now it's way more visible. That's good, but it's still so tiny. It's such a tiny number. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's an important number, right? It should be more prominent, which means we want to add 
maybe a custom font. And indeed, that's something that we actually tackled in one of the previous videos about new versions of Pico 8. So in this older video that I did about the version 0.2.5, I talked about the new features of custom fonts. Fonts were introduced actually in the previous version, but in this version we had fonts with variable uh, font width. And we, I also uh, worked together with a, um, with a font designer called Sampex, and he actually made a uh, beautiful custom font uh, available in a, like a Pico 8 version. And there's a shout out that we have here. The font is called Voice. It's on, available on, on itch.io for free. And when you click here on a demo, you can download the voice.p8. I'm going to zoom in. There we go. Voice.p8 file and that file uh, that's a pico8 file that contains the custom font and that exports the custom font let me show you how that looks okay so i think this is the the file that i was talking about so if you download voice.p8 it should i think look like this it just shows you the uh, custom font and it says you that the snippet was copied to the clipboard which means you can now copy it into your uh, into your code but i just wanted to show you real quick what the, what this what this thing looks like and again i did a walkthrough on this on the video you can uh, get go through it uh, yourself if you want to uh, but just like a, to give you an idea each of the different characters or the different glyphs are here in a sprite sheet and you can edit them and then here in the actual code you can change the character width and change the character height there is different widths for different sets of characters for the emoji type characters to use the different uh, width and then there's custom character spacing. So you define like uh, for each of the different types of glyphs, you go um, zero plus one plus, uh, plus two or minus one plus minus two and so forth. So you can tweak um, the spacing between the, the different characters from the, the default. The default is gonna be zero, but if you want a character to be a bit wider, then you make it plus one or plus two or plus three. And you just use those strings here to to define this and all this information get also exported in the um, the stuff that's copied into the clipboard and now this is the font that i designed for uh, for the shmup now this font is a little bit um let me show you where this came from so this is here's a book called um arcade game typography right so this is a book that i got for this specific purpose and if you it just contains whole different fonts for from different uh from different arcade machines and this one in specific that's from a game called passing shot uh released in 1988 by sega i don't know what this game is at all about and the font that i have here is kind of like inspired by this i did some changes here i made um the font a little bit narrower and um, also the font in the arcade machine has very thick outlines. We're not gonna have that. I only use the uppercase letters for, uh, from the font. And the thing that I'm really most interested in are the, um, the numbers. That's why there is, there's like it's some sample font, some sample text being written out uh, here, right? And I put some dots in between to like tweak the spacing between the numbers uh, because I want the numbers to be basically monospaced. So I want each number to have the same width. But um, I want to be able to, like you see between the seven and eight, there is a space between seven and eight. And I want that space to be potentially narrower than an entire number. And we're gonna do that to do some like really nice, you know, formatting of the number. So the number is really nice and clearly readable. That's something that's very important to me. So the spaces between the letters are actually smaller than an actual net letter. We're gonna talk about that later. There's one more thing that I also do did here. There is a lot of junk in here in this font that we're never, we're never gonna use. And in fact, before we release the game, I probably will do a pass and remove all of the characters that we never end up using. I just leave them in for now just to have something. Um, but also something I did is there's here, you see this character here? So this is like a icon of our spaceship. And we're gonna draw that on the bottom of the screen uh, to indicate how many lives you still have left. That way I don't need to have this kind of icon in the sprite sheet, I save some sprite sheet space. In fact, this might be a cool method to take a bunch of stuff from, that you usually would take up sprite sheet space and to put them in the font. So that way you can free up some sprite sheet space and use it for something that actually has multiple colors and stuff like that. For small icons like this, this is perfect. So this is the font and I will supply this font uh, in the code at the end of the episode, it's gonna be in the assets folder. Uh, and for now, I'm going to run this. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to fix something. Oh, man. Uh, during development, this always bugged me. I don't like how the 9 looks. Do you know how the 9 has like this huge chin? 
I don't like that. But I was thinking that maybe this is a little bit mid truncated. I'm going to try to trunk it at nine for now. And we're going to see how that looks. Because the font has, has basically like the style is always that the bottom line is very tall. So all of the f all of the letters have like this enormous chunky chin. It, this is a bit of a cartoony font, but that was like intentional. I wanted it to be a bit silly. <laughs> this is a bit of a silly game. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I will reduce the chin of the nine a little bit. I'm gonna see how that works. Right, I'm gonna save this, I'm gonna run. Now the font is copied in the clipboard. Now let's go back to Kaushma. All right, and now we just need to paste it in somewhere. Um, let us paste it in here. Bam, it's just a huge poke. It's already split, so it's encoded into a, um, a, a comma-separated um, string and then split into an array and then poked into memory. So uh, let's run this. Nothing changes because we're not using the font actually. So let's use the font. So here, there is a magic number that we have to do. We have to do a magic poke. So this is how we turn it on. So it's 5F58, that's the address. And if you poke in 0x81 into that address, you turn on the custom font and then you turn it off again by uh, poking zero into that address. Let's run this. And there we go, babies. Ah, ah, so beautiful. Oh, doesn't that look just nice and juicy and ah, oh, so nice to read. Big chunky font. The drop shadow really adds to the readability as well. Um, we could maybe think about adding an outline. I don't like adding an outline because for the outline, you have to draw the font, the same text four times in addition. And that's that, that drawing font is uh, surprisingly drawing fonts to the screen is surprisingly uh, CPU intensive. So I want to draw redraw the same text as as little as possible. But I think this is this is fine when it comes to readability. Uh, there's some things that I don't like about it, and that is we have to talk typography. You know how if you have like a big number, it's hard to tell how many millions that is, right? It's hard to tell. The magnitude is even difficult to, to, uh, to fathom, right? So what you have to do is like you have to always take threes. And now you see, oh, okay, it's, it's 12 billion, right? Yeah, it's 12 billion, 300 million, right? Now you see because you separated the, you chunked the characters into, into groups of three. I want to do this when I um, draw the score to the screen. I want to chunk the digits into groups of three so they're easier to parse visually, so it's easier to see how much score you have. All right, but first of all, let me let me clean up here a little bit. So first of all, you see how we, like, we're just repeating the same command, right? I think it's a good idea, and I'm gonna do that. Um, I think it's a good idea to do this, like this drawing a font with a shadow of adding this as a thing as a, as, a, as a command, right? So we're gonna go in tab number three, that's the tools. And we're gonna go function, and we're gonna go sprint, shadow print. And it's gonna be a text x, y, color. And it's, we're not gonna specify the shadow color. We could add shadow color to this. If we need that, we're gonna add that. And that's just gonna do two prints. And it's gonna print the text. text um, x y plus one with a color one and then uh, x y with a color c right so this will just print whatever we have with a shadow and uh, we can now replace this with just one command it just save us some command because there's going to be more ui stuff and it would be nice i think it's a nice idea to be able to, uh, we're gonna get some use out of that function. Nothing changed, it's just like we repackaged this into a, a command, cool. All right, so now how do we get the, space, the spaces in there? Um, we're gonna need to, we're gonna need to add a function that inserts spaces at the right moments, like the right, places in the string, right? So every three characters I want to uh, splice in a space in a string. So that's gonna be something like local, um, my SCR, my score, 
could be my screen as well, right? Uh, equals um, two. Um, so we're gonna get this one out. And I'm gonna put it back in. Um, and we're gonna go ins add space. I'm gonna add a function to add spaces. And I'm again I'm putting it in a function because there's gonna be multiple places where we're gonna print our score. So this is a process that we're gonna do with at multiple places in the game. Um, so we now need to add a create a function that introduces spaces into a string. Now function add space. And t is going to be our text. So, first of all, we can reliably say if the number of um, t, uh, like if the, the number of characters is less than three, less or equal equals three, then return t. You not don't have to introduce any spaces if the char if the number only has three digits, right? If it's nine hundred. There is no space that goes in there, right? We only add a space once we reach four digits because then we have 1,000, so it's one space and then the rest, right? Um, so it's something like this, right? And now we can do something smart. We can do um, um, recursion. We can solve this recursively because we don't know really how many spaces we need, we need to add, but we can always take the last three characters from a string, add a space, and then push the rest into that function again. And that function, that function then will take next three characters, add a space and so forth. And we'll continue doing this until the reminder of characters is less than three. And then there's not gonna be any space getting introduced anymore. And it will just return, uh, return the text, right? It will return the reminder. So we're gonna write something like return, um, add space, remainder. So this is the recursive part where the function is calling itself, right? Um, dot dot uh, space. That's where we're actually adding the space, and then uh, last three characters, right? I'm just like writing some pseudo code here so we understand what is going. We take the reminder, like everything except of the last three characters, dumping it into this that function again, uh, then add a space at the end, and then take the last three characters. Now this is the space, this is the moment where we um, negotiate, we're gonna figure out what the sub function is. Sub is always something that is very confusing to me. So the sub function allows us to extract a, uh, a couple of characters from a bigger string, right? So uh, we have the sub, uh, we supply it with a string, we say the start and the end. Now, uh, positive um, numbers means we are starting to count at the left and negative numbers means we start counting at the right. So yeah, so we have to, if you have something and we go minus five, that means we're gonna go from the back. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. So it's gonna be thing, right? Uh, yeah, that's gonna be thing, exactly. Right, so we're gonna to have to write two smart sub functions to accomplish what we're gonna to have to accomplish. First, let us talk about the reminder. Uh, that's gonna be sub t. We're gonna start at the beginning of the string, so at the, the big number, and then minus four. It's minus four. That's a bit confusing. It should be, you would think it's a minus three, but it's because you leave out three characters and then the fourth is when you start cutting, right? Uh, and so that's, that's why it has to be minus four and not minus three. So we start at the, at the front of the string and then we go to minus four at the end of the string, right? Uh, one at the beginning of the string and then one, two, three. We're gonna, not gonna export those four, so that's where we're gonna start exporting. That's gonna be the reminder. And then here, uh, last three characters, that's gonna be easy peasy. Sub t uh, minus three. I think that's it. I'm not sure if it's minus three or minus three minus one. Let's, let's see if that works. Um, let's run this. Yes, it totally works. Look at this. Look at this. Wait, wait, what's happening? What's happening? Can we get a million, please? Oh gosh, dude, this big enemy is also just one. Give me a million. Yes, the million also works. Yeah, 
so this totally works. That's awesome. There is a, there is a problem. Uh, the problem is typography, as always. Um, so, okay, so I think Christian from the future needs to interject here because Christian from the past had difficulties nailing this issue. Generally, the question I am trying to answer for me is where on the screen to put the score. Right now, we have it in the upper left corner and it is left justified. This is easy to code, but it is not ideal. You see, something that I find very important when reading large numbers is that the individual digits are easy to keep track of. This is particularly important here because the number might be changing as you read it. This is why I made sure that the 10 numerals in our font have the same width. If you have a changing number display and the numbers are a variable width, then you will see the individual digits jitter on the screen and that is really awful to read. So we dodged that bullet already, but there is still a second issue. You see, here in the West, the numbers are written kind of backwards from how we write text. We write text from left to right, but numbers actually work from right to left, kind of. The smallest digit is on the very right side of the number and the value of each digit goes up as you move to the left. This is not a big deal if you are using a, you know, like a static number in a sentence, for example. But you know that for things like table calculations, you want your numbers to be right justified so the digits with the same value end up aligned with each other. When creating displays that show changing numbers with a lot of digits, it is also a good idea to make them right justified. That way the value of a digit doesn't change as the number of digits grows. Maybe to explain what I mean here are two numbers, one is left justified and one is right justified, and note how the lowest digit of the left justified number keeps moving around as the value changes. This is why calculators or like, I don't know, gas station displays and all sorts of other numerical displays will be generally right justified. So now if we want to have a right justified score, this also means in turn we kind of also want it on the right side of the screen. And this is because we don't know just how much space we need to write out a typical score in our game. You see GJLS3 kind of falling into that kind of trap. They have a right justified score, but it seems like they want to print it on the left side of the screen. So when a game starts, you have like this awkward orphan zero floating in the middle of the screen. Only after we get a few points, the layout starts making sense. And that's just not great. This is all to say that in terms of layout, I think the score reads best when the number is right justified and on the right edge of the screen. But of course, Pico 8 still writes text from left to right. So in order to right justify a piece of text, you need to know how long that text is. So you know where the left edge of that text is, where to start printing that text. And past Christian will now explain why this is a problem. We don't know how long the number is. That is because um, the spaces that we introduce here kind of like shift the width of the number a little bit. Sometimes you, you add a digit and it in, adds like in just one digit, but sometimes you add a digit and it adds a digit and the space, right? So it's a little bit messy to find out the width of the number. And I know it, we're kind of like making our, like we could just leave it like this and it would be fine. But that's something that I, I study design, this is important to me. Um, so, so let me cook. So it would be something like this, like, um, we would draw the score, where's, where are we drawing the score? Uh, sprint, right? So instead of uh, drawing it on, on uh, coordinate 2, we would draw it 126 minus, and now the width of the, of the character. Now let's assume there is no spaces, or the spaces are uh, exactly as wide as the numbers are. So in this case, we would do like uh, my scr, hashtag my scr. I'm not sure how width, how, how wide the, the numbers are. Let's multiply it by seven. And, and let's try this like this. Seems good. And but you see, you see already it's the entire thing is shifting. Maybe eight. Nope. Six. Yeah, there we go. That's that's correct. So you see, once you get let me let me increase by smaller numbers. Let's do 500. Alright, so this is good, this is good. Now we have shifted the entire number to the right. This is still good. And it will shift even more. I'm, I'm not gonna stay stand here and wait until, but yeah, this is already, already not good, right? So we need to now account for the fact that the spaces are not as wide as the actual characters. Um, and for that, I'm gonna create a new, uh, new function. And that is gonna be function 
um, SCR len score length and it's gonna be it's gonna be just like this little shortcut here so we're gonna return uh, hashtag t wait it shouldn't be t oh my gosh because we're using t for something else <gasps> let's go txt oh see that's a problem we're using t for all these other things oh my gosh oh replacing every every t Okay, txt, txt, good. So in this case, we're gonna return the hashtag txt like this, uh, multiplied times six. Um, so that's what we have here, right? So we're gonna do crlen my cr. That's still wrong, but now we package it into its own own function. Okay, so this is good. But uh, now we want to inc inc decrease the width when it's uh, when the number of characters gets to a certain amount, right? So it's going to be something like minus. We're not never going to have four characters in our in our string, right? Because if you have four, that means we have three digits, one space, and then there should be another digit. So we go go from three immediately to five, right? So that's weird. So I think it's going to be something like hashtag txt divided, but it's going to be the backslash divided by 4 multiplied by 2. Something like this. Let's try that. Ah, it's still shifting a little bit. Okay, um, by 3? Nope. It should be by... Wait. Oh yeah, yeah, it triggered too early. Mm -hmm. So it should be by 5 maybe. Wait, what? So the first one is good. And then it shifts a little bit. Um, maybe it's plus, let's try that. No, it's, it's absolutely not plus. Minus, oh, it's maybe then just like four, like this. Yeah, just playing around with numbers a little bit. This seems a lot better. Okay, so actually let us um, see if the Let's increase the score every frame um, to make it go through more numbers. Let's put it on, up here in a draw function. Just something for us to have. Uh, let's try it like this. Oops. Oh. Uh, let's put it in here, whatever. All right, so the score goes up. And you can see now the, the number is stable, right? So the the lower numbers are always in the same space. You, the, the number doesn't shift as it gets bigger. It shifts, like the, it grows in, in to, to the left and it has space to grow to the left. It doesn't have to move. Uh, it's kind of difficult to explain what I'm saying, but I hope you get you get you you catch my drift. All right, so this is, looks good. The, uh, the, the first shift happens correctly, but let us now increase the speed because I want to see if, uh, m if you get million correct. Wow, numbers sh sure grow slow, huh? Sh sh shall we get the million? Oh my gosh, it takes such a long time. This is why cookie clicker kind of games are difficult. It's so difficult to wrap your head around large numbers. Oh no, it shifted badly. You see, it shifted badly. It shifted not good. Oh, so maybe it should be four after all. Yeah, yeah, I think it was supposed to be for after all. I sh could have increased the, the, the rate of score increase, but nah. Yes! I figured it out. Okay, good. Beautiful. So now we have two functions to beautifully format our, our uh, score. The score is in the right position on the screen. I think the right position of the screen is good. There's a bunch of tokens we use for that. I'm sorry about that but it's gonna be for the best. Let us wrap up this episode by making sure that all of the uh, state machines are working fine. So I think we already have a state machine. There's, yeah, there's update menu and update, uh, uh, update uh, draw menu. Um, but now also one way, what I want to have is also lives and I won't die when I, when I run out of lives. So let's, let's quickly add this. So we're gonna go lives 
equals two. And then when we die, die, there we go, die. So first we die, then there's like a freezing effect and we die for reals, we explode and so forth, and then we respawn, right? So here, we're gonna go lives minus equal one, and then I'm gonna go if lives um, is smaller than zero, then, and then there's gonna be a different update function um, and a different draw function, and those will be about the game over. <clears throat> So uh, we're gonna call it Gover, up at update Gover, and draw Gover. And then that will look like this. Draw menu, draw Gover. We're gonna do a CLS one, a CLS zero. Just draw an empty screen for the game over. We're gonna write something nice. Let's let's write something nice on the screen. Print. Uh, 30, 32, 7, you're dead. We're going to fix this later. Uh, and then update function. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the same update uh, as here. I'm going to do update Gover. Oops. And then if we press any button, we're going to go back to the main menu. So then um, it's going to be this. Like so. Now, I don't have any life counter. Let me let me draw a life counter to the screen. Um, so here in the GUI. So why is the custom font is still on? I want to print. So I looked it up. This is the character that... <laughs> Makes sense. The human character is the amount of lives we have. And then uh, dot dot lives, right? So that's not something that I want. Well, that's the number of lives we have, exactly. And that's something I want to draw down at the bottom of the screen. I don't know, 120 and then seven. And it's going to be the shadow print. So sprint. It's down there. It's a little bit too far. 119. Yeah, perfect. So we have two lives, now I'm gonna get hit. One life, I'm gonna get hit. Zero lives, last life, I'm gonna hit one again, and then I'm dead. Hmm, the music didn't stop. So it's music minus one, and then, uh, oops, I think if you add a second value, that's gonna be like a fade out. Let's, let's try that. Okay, this was a little bit too sudden, uh, but also, mm, that didn't, that didn't, mm, okay. No, we don't want to go to game, we're gonna to go to menu. What did I do here? Like this, let's try this again. Perfect. And now we are in back menu, menu, and now we start again. Good, good, good. Okay, um, there are some things that I still don't like. There is no fading. I want to make it add a fading function to fade out between the different states. And I think that death is a little bit sudden. Like it just cuts to black immediately. And I would like to show a little bit of gameplay after you died. Um, so we still have to tweak this a little bit. But broadly speaking, we have the fundamentals down. We write custom font to the screen. The UI looks a little bit more cleaned up and everything. And uh, we have the basic state machine. Oh, also I want to add the state machine to uh, when you actually play through the game. So let me let me fix this a little bit. So we need to add fading state machine at the end. Um, better game over screen. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit maybe. Um, extend game over. So these are the to do things for the next episode. Uh, before we end, I just want to make sure that you know that uh, the font is gonna be, uh, if you download the code down in the doobly-doo, the font is gonna be in the assets folder. And I will also upload in the, into the 
prototypes folder, I will put in all the prototypes that we did on the last previous two episodes so we can test the different different uh, versions of the game that we prototyped already. For now, let us talk about the things that we talk about at the end of each episode, which is a big shout out and a huge thank you to all the people who are supporting me, who are supporting the show on coffee.com. Thank you so much for your support, for holding out the torch for me. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that support. This time around, I also want to ask, answer a question. This is from Sven Spron. Uh, they asked on episode 82. Question, if you want to focus fire and hyper bomb in your game, why not just have to ship auto fire when no button is pressed and then use one of the buttons for focus and the other for hyper? Sorry if I addressed this at some point, but that um, but that thought was bugging me in the entire video. LOL. Uh, yeah, so I already addressed this I think in the previous, but I think it's worth repeating again. I am against, I am fundamentally against auto firing until it's completely un uh, unavoidable. For something like in a uh, or a mobile game, like a cell phone game, uh, auto fire would be fine. But I think if you have buttons, then I think a button should be firing. This is a bit of a um, philosophical approach. I think um, you should be the one, the player should be one doing the verb, which is shooting. It's a shooting game, right? So you should be doing the shooting. You shouldn't be just along for the ride with the shooting, right? The same thing with a racing game. Uh, you want to have a button that accelerates even if practically you will be holding that button the entire race. Still, you are the one who is driving the car, so you should have a button that is the equivalent of a gas pedal. And if you don't have the equivalent of a gas pedal, you're not really in control of the car, you're just along for the ride. And uh, I think that's a subtle shift, and it's, yeah, technically it doesn't make much difference, but I think like in terms of who you are and what your role is in the game, I think it's important to have the ability to shoot. Also, we saw in uh, the prototyping that there's actually quite a lot of situations where you might not want to shoot. For example, you want the screen to fill up with enemies. Um, that might be more of a high-end strategy, but still, uh, when you are suddenly in a position when you don't want to shoot and you don't have the ability, that feels bad. It feels like you are just like, what am I even doing, right? Like suddenly it puts you at odds with the game's mechanics. So yeah, I think I'm a big believer in having a shoot button. That's why I definitely want to have a shoot button. And let's be clear, yes, it's difficult to get the abilities into just like two buttons of Pico 8. It would be great if we had more buttons. But also, that's the whole point of Pico 8. Like, to get you into those thinking about the buttons, questioning whether you need them, to get you interesting solutions, to get you iterate on the abilities and question the abilities. That's good stuff. Even though it's a huge challenge and it's, uh, I'm struggling with this and so forth, I don't mind having this as a design challenge. This is your job as a game designer to get over these issues. And to be fair, Out of Fire could be a very valid solution for other people. I hope that clears up that question. Anyway, so this was back in the saddle after a big prototyping. Next time around, we're gonna do a little bit of fading and then tweak, uh, tweak the state machine a little bit. And then we're gonna jump into those options. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.